There's a story told of a, a man who was in the last stages of his life, quite ill, and it was looking quite likely that he wouldn't be around for so long. And a priest came to visit him, to give him the last rites, and the, the man was reflecting on his life. Uh, and he said, he said, sure, I've, had, I've had a good life, really. Um, I wasted my inheritance, really, on, on, on gambling and drinking, and I was unfaithful to the wife a couple of times, but uh, you know, I wasn't always there for the kids, but sure. At least I never lost the faith. And the priest was there thinking, <laughs> well, <laughs> like, your faith is supposed to influence your daily life and decisions. We kind of have this idea also in, in, in modern culture that in certain circumstances, if you do some things good or one thing good, then everything is good. Or if you do something bad, then everything is bad. And <clears throat> truth, reality, and things actually, in God's, from God's perspective, are not that simple. Okay, so like you'll often hear today, like, you know, maybe superstars, you know, who've been unfaithful to their wives and um, have gotten involved in all sorts of drunken debauchery. But, you know, they, 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 they save animals. They've saved a koala bear <coughs> or something. And, or they, they've started a, a, a charity or something. And okay, so it's good that they start a charity, it's good that they save koala bears, we're delighted. Um, but just because you do something good doesn't mean everything you do is good. Conversely, we can think of like family situations here which, are, which, are which can be complicated, and you've got then faithful parents or faithful people looking on, saying, you know, these two people, they're living together and they have kids, uh, so therefore nothing they do is right. They're so living in sin, so everything is awful, right? Okay, so we have to find, we have to find a way of, of, of balancing these things here. Look at what happens in today's reading. It's very, very interesting. Uh, it's very curious, actually. You know, St. Paul, who wasn't a man to, to, to pull his punches in any way, shape, or form, is walking through Athens, okay? It's this Greek city. And they have various monuments. I remember, this is the word of Scripture. Don't, something, don't, don't shoot the messenger here. Uh, they have various monuments built to various gods. They are pagans, right? So they, the, the, the Greeks worshipped all sorts of gods. Now, the Greeks, being fairly smart, had a, a monument to an unknown god, just to cover their bases in case they missed one. Right? So we've got the sun god, we've got the moon god, we've got the earth god, we've got the god of war, we've got the god of thunder, we've got Zeus to kind of cover them all. And then we've got the unknown god, just in case we skipped one. Okay? Very smart. Right, so to an unknown God. So Paul is walking along, and he says, I notice as I strolled around, <laughs> admiring your sacred monuments, I'm not sure if he was really admiring them, but I don't know, uh, that you had an altar inscribed to an unknown God. Well, the God whom I proclaim is in fact the one that you already worship without knowing it. Right, so he goes on to tell them then about, you know, about Jesus. So, strictly speaking, is that true? Well, you see, Jesus isn't a God among gods, or our Trinitarian God isn't a God among gods. He's the only God. These other gods don't exist at all, right? But rather than starting there, as I was walking around looking at your heathen statues, ye shower of pagans, ye idolaters, thou shalt burn. Um, really bad start, okay? It's, it's not going to be a very effective missionary approach. Now, he does then go on. You see, he does go on then to say, since we are children of God, We've no excuse for thinking that the deity looks like anything that we can make in silver or gold or stone. So any statue that we can make isn't God. So he gets the truth eventually. Okay, so if you really, this is, this, this is, there's an important lesson in this. All right, it's called missionary tact. Missionary tact. And a, a, a very, very important approach in being tactful as a missionary, which, by the way, we're going to have to do ever more so, the more society veers away from God, the more we're going to have to actually stand up and defend our faith or explain our faith. The more our families don't practice, the more we have to witness to the truth of the gospel. So we have to know how to do this. And a key issue, which St. Paul does here, and which we'll see in a second now that Jesus does as well, is you start by affirming the good. You affirm the good. You don't start with the sin. You affirm the good, right? You affirm the good. That's really, really important. 
Now, affirming the good, see, like, let, let's not swing to one extreme or the other. Extre- affirming the good doesn't mean everything is good. No more than highlighting the sin doesn't mean everything is wrong. But you start by affirming the good. Now, this is a dangerous kind of a homily, I know, but sure look. Um, you think of, I, I'm thinking of like, you know, parents who have children who, so grown children, my adult children, who are living with their boyfriends or girlfriends and have kids. Now, on one hand, they might be really good parents. You know, actually, you know, Johnny there, like, he, he works hard and, and, he, and he's faithful to Mary. And, uh, you know, he's, he's really good with the kids. He spends time with them. And, you know, he goes out and he plays soccer with them and he picks them up from school when he's, you know, when he's not doing his shift work. He's a really good dad. And, and Mary's, you know, she's, she, she, does, she does her best and, you know, she's whatever. The whole story. Great. But they're not married. Now... As a parent, as a priest, as a missionary in general, as a disciple of Christ, you could walk into their home and say, you know that you're living in sin? Now, I guarantee you, that mission will fall flat on its face. Now, what you've said is objectively true, but Jesus, I really wouldn't phrase it that way. But you, just, you don't start there. You, don't st- you can't start there. If you start there, it's the end of your mission. So it's not, the question isn't, is it true or not? The question is, is it, is it prudent or not? Is this a good, is this a prudent starting point to win people back for Christ? Okay, again, the question isn't, is it true? The question is, is it prudent? Okay, so we start with the affirmation. You affirm the good. Well, look at little, little, little Johnny Jr. there. Isn't he absolutely fantastic? Well, fair play to you. You're wonderful parents. A good priest friend of mine from um, the north of Ireland, uh, nor, the, which one am I supposed to say? Which, the nor, Northern Ireland. Part of the same country, different jurisdiction, whatever the thing is I'm supposed to not to say. Um, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Father Jerry McCluskey, uh, he was, when he was uh, working in, in a parish there, what he used to often do in this pastoral situation where you meet couples who are living together uh, with kids but not married, is he'd go for a little walk with Johnny Sr. And say, well, Johnny, fair play to you now. You, you know, you've, you've, a, you've a lovely family. You've a lovely family. Ah, sure, thanks, thanks for thanks for um, and then he'd say to him, look, is there any chance now you'd like to give Mary a bit of a, kind of a guarantee that she'll be around? Oh, she, she knows I'll be around, she knows I'll be around, yeah, yeah. But if you say before God and before the community, I'll be beside you until death separates us. Oh, yeah, that'd be a lovely gift for her, wouldn't it? That'd be a lovely thing to do, wouldn't it? I know far, I don't know. I know, I think it would, I think it would. Tell you what, like, you can have the church any weekend you want now from April 16th until da 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 Right, and we'll take care of you. Not a bother. All right, just let me know what date would suit you. And he said he got loads of weddings from that. As opposed to saying, Johnny, you're living in sin. Okay, and this is detrimental to your soul. You know, like it just affirm the good, affirm the good. And it worked. So you help get the couple married, blessed before God. But they also need to see in us as believers that we don't approach them with a pointed finger, that we approach them with an open heart. Okay? You think of the, uh, the woman at the well. It's a very interesting, it's a, it's a relatively short kind of a compact mission, right? Jesus does this, this very brief mission, only in a couple of sentences really, with this woman at the well. So, um, so the disciples are off in the city of Sikar uh, buying food. A Samaritan woman comes to the well. Jesus asks her for a drink. How is it that you, a Jew, ask me, a woman, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? And Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift of God, and if you knew who it is that is asking you for a drink, you yourself would have asked, and he would have given you living water. So he's, he's kind of offering her something. He's offering her living water, now he, and he goes on to repeat it. The woman asks, uh, you've no bucket. How are you going to give me living water? You've, you'll obviously need my bucket. What, what are you talking about? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave, who gave us this well and drank from it himself? Jesus said, whoever drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give will never be thirsty, for the water that I shall give will well up in them as a spring welling up to eternal life. So he's talking to her about satisfying her deepest needs. He's, he's offering her something. The woman said to her, sir, give me this water that I may never be thirsty, I may never have to come to, to draw water again. Jesus said, go call your husband and come back here. 
The woman said, I have no husband. And Jesus replied, You're right to say you have no husband. For although you've had five husbands, the one you have now is not your husband. Okay, so we have to be very, very careful here. Not to misunderstand me, not to misunderstand Jesus, not to misunderstand uh, St. Paul, not that I'm really in their company or in that bracket of people, one being a saint, one being God, and then there's only me. But point being, uh, to learn how to affirm the good first, which is, does not mean you never deal with the truth, you know, or you never deal with the, the, the more difficult or, or, or sensitive issues. Of course not. We can't compromise on the truth. But you don't necessarily start with where the sin is or, or where the, 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 the rot is, where the need for pruning is. It's the same, same with any good teacher. You know what I mean? Like if, if your kid comes in and he's got like 10 questions done and two are wrong and you say, well, you got question seven, that's disastrous. And question nine, that's the worst approach I've ever seen to it. It's ridiculous. <sighs> now, you might, might be true, but like maybe questions one to six were quite good. So you affirm the good and then say, okay, well, we need to work on this as well, though, if that's all right. Okay, can you try those two again? It's good teaching. It's just good teaching. It's good parenting. You know, a parent who only tells the child where they've gotten wrong, you know, after a football match, you know, the child scores three points and misses two. Now, the second point that you miss, see what you should have done, what you should have, see, you weren't looking. You, you know, you, 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 you took it right. It's just, it's, it's, it's bad parenting. Just to only speak about the bad. Uh, there's a priest, Father James Mallon, in his book, which he wrote called Divine Renovation. Uh, he speaks about this, this pastoral reality the priests have to face where maybe parents come and they want a child baptized. Now the parents aren't practicing or aren't married or whatever it may be. So they come to the parish and they ask for the sacrament. Now the sacrament obviously is for the child, not for the parents. So if, if they want the child baptized, you know, as I say, the, the sacrament is administered to the child. So yes, even if the parent's situation is irregular, it can be done. But, he said, obviously if they're not practicing and they baptize the child, they're not going to bring the child to Mass. Because they don't go themselves. So, so, but the sacrament is administered to the child and he, the child deserves the sacrament. So what do you do? You have this, like, this pastoral dilemma which is becoming ever increasingly uh, common. And he said, okay, so what we do is, it's kind of this idea of affirming the good. He said, you start by matching high welcome with high expectation. You want your child baptised. That is fantastic. This is the parish for you. Well, I tell you what now. This is absolutely amazing. Uh, little, little Jerry now, uh, when he's baptised, he's, he's a little, little saint. Well, he's almost a saint now. We'll baptise him now. We'll do, we'll do a great job. So what we'll do is, then if the parents aren't practising, he proposes. What we do so is, um, since uh, yourselves now, we, we, haven't, we haven't seen you a whole pile around here. Would it be all right now? If I, we sign you up for an alpha course, so a nine-session nine alpha course uh, uh, before, we, before we head into the baptism at all. How about that? And um, some will say yes and some will say no. But then after the alpha course, then there's, a, I think, a six-week baptismal preparation course, which is a crash course in Catholicism. Why do we baptize? What is the church? Who is Jesus? What's Holy Communion? And it's a crash course in what we believe and why. And then after that, baptism. Okay, so it's a, I don't know, overall, I think it's a, almost a three-month three month waiting period and process and, you know, the whole thing. Now, he said, previously, before this, I would have about maybe 50 baptisms a year, kind of one a week-ish, um, and of, of those who I would baptize, zero would continue practicing. So after the baptism, you see none of them again. You don't see any of the parents again until First Holy Communion or Confirmation. He said, after we started this, 10%, which may not sound like a huge success, but he said 10% of the families started practicing. So of 50 families, five families would start practicing. So you'd see them every Sunday with their little freshly baptized boy or girl, right? Uh, now, five families might not sound like much, but in three years, that's 15 families. In five years, it's 25 families. You think of any parish church with 25 families, not people, families. Now, they're, because they're young and they're vibrant, they're your volunteers and your stewards and your, your readers and your choir. They're your altar servers. I mean, like you're building up the church from the ground up. Match high welcome with high expectation. High welcome on its own is useless, will bear no fruit. High, everyone, the doors are wide open, but you don't have to do anything. 
They'll come for the major celebrations and you'll never see them again. High welcome with high expectation. Affirm the good and still call to conversion. But affirm the good. Start with the good. This is it's what we learn from, from today's reading. It's what we learn from the Lord himself. So we ask the good Lord to teach us, teach us to be good missionaries, to, to never see ourselves as better than others just because we might know the truth or have, have had the, the blessing of, have, of having had good parents or good pastors or whatever it may be. We learn the faith through no merit of our own. Others haven't been so blessed. So we, we affirm the good and we show them. We show them by our lives, by our mercy, by our love. This faith, it's, it's life-giving, it's healing, it's freeing. And then the Lord will work in their hearts and help them to see, yes, maybe that the situation is, is not what God wants. But let them get there. Give, give them time to get there. Show them the way and, and let them get there. We match high expectation. Uh, high, high welcome with high expectation. And we do so so that all might experience that they are children of a loving God. A God who sets them free. Free from themselves, free from sin, free from death. A God who wants their company forever in heaven.